today is in Girona the one of the professor of Oxford University Richard Tav that is uh, known uh, for several works and uh, for us uh, maybe the the, the first uh, contact, intellectual contact was your uh, your book about uh, Says on Gales and uh, edited uh, with uh, uh, William Twining and was and th that was uh, an excellent uh, book about the the works the the work and, uh, and of of Gelsen. Then uh, Richard has had work work, work about uh, several topics: uh, ethics, uh, time and law, uh, professional ethics, and in. Uh, in, in 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 the twenty uh, no uh, two thousand and two two thousand and three and 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 next uh, uh, last uh, the the last year and and now uh, Richard is is working about uh, the feasibilism uh, and this is uh, uh, and this is the the occasion for for knowing. Personally, Richard, that is uh, an extremely kind occasion because uh, Richard uh, is one of the uh, the authors of uh, the book that uh, edit uh, Giovanni and and, uh, and I are about uh, the feasibilism in law, and also because Richard is the organizer of a workshop in Oxford last year that is extremely kind and extremely useful for the discussion of uh, the feasibilism in, in law. This is his first visit to Girona, but for us it's only the first visit and I, I hope uh, that uh, for Richard is also only the first visit. <coughs> the paper that presents that Richard presents today, it's a paper about Kelsen and the alternative character of legal norm. A paper that presents a reading of Kelsen as a defeasibilist, maybe a reading of Kelsen as a re legal realist, uh, not uh, that is a, a, a reading of Gelson that uh, um, some of us, uh, <laughs> for some of us, is uh, is uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, very very Crazy. very <laughs> inter no ve no 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 very interesting very interesting reading, Giovanni is uh, the promotor uh, Giovanni uh, in, in Girona is the uh, supporter of, the, of this idea of this uh, uh, smart, uh, uh, way of, of, re of reading Kelsen and I think uh, at the moment it's not the only supporter of this idea thank you very much Richard and it's up to you thank you thank you Thank you, Jordi. Thank you, Giovanni. Had I known how beautiful Girona is, I would have been even nicer to you both <laughs> in Oxford. Um, it's a lovely, old, traditional city. I am staying in the centre. I have not seen much, but what little I have seen has filled me with a desire, perhaps, to visit again when I have more time. Today's paper is my throwing down of a gauntlet, a challenge to some of my Anglo-American opponents. 
I was very kindly invited to give a paper because I'd written one on defeasibilism in 2001 in the Oxford Journal to the collection. I did not know until this invitation that there was more than one defeasibilist <laughs> in the entire world. So it was good to meet people with similar interest, although some of them have views that I do not entirely share. In the seminar workshop in Oxford, I concluded the paper with, I was asked to talk about defeasibilism and adjudication, and to show, as I thought I have shown, it is certainly a valid methodological assumption. Also, it is a salient feature of legal systems. Defeasibilism happens in legal systems. Not only, I want to claim, in the common law, but also in civil law systems. But my brief on that occasion was to be illustrative, to be descriptive. Some of my opponents on that occasion wished to challenge my sub-thesis, my sub-text, but there's more to defeasibilism than merely methodology, merely salient feature. I want to try, it's my endeavour, to try to ground defeasibilism within legal theory. I may not succeed, but today's paper is my attempt to capture Kelson for my school of thought. Poor boy, Kelson Hans has not been sufficiently appreciated, but now I will make great man of him. And I start with, among his many, and does everyone have a copy of the text? Because I appreciate that although I will try to speak slowly and distinctly, <laughs> I can get intellectually carried away. <laughs> but starting off, one of his most maddening and beguiling notions, perplexing, paradoxical, is the alternative character of the norm. To the side, I say, it has not been sufficiently studied. Most people have ignored this crazy notion of Kelsen's. I want to offer an appreciation, interpretation of this, and then I want to deploy my understanding of Kelsen's thesis about the alternative character of the norm to support my crazy notion that all legal norms are susceptible as a matter of law of defeat, disapplication, or whatever, disregard. I turn to Kelsen's dynamic aspect of the law. This is part of, a small part by the way, this is not my only argument, small part of my endeavour to put defeasibilism onto the legal theory map as a contender along with other legal theories, as a mature development out of certain types of legal positivism and other legal theories. Of course, some people look at me and say, I'm odd, I'm perverse, how can you enlist Kelsey? Mainstream jurisprudence, at least in my country, and I certainly think in America, have tended to regard Kelson's theory as grounded in the barren soil of exclusive legal positivism. Maybe the least service has been done to dear old hands by my friend Joseph Raz. Raz's notion of law, claiming to be an interpretation of Kelson, moves Kelson a long way from where I thought he was when I was a boy. I think mainstream jurisprudence has been one-eyed, has seen Kelsen only in one way. But listen to this. This is Kelsen. The pure theory of law is not opposed to the free law school. Rather, it is true that the pure theory of law, with its deeper insight into the structure of law, has given a theoretical foundation to one of the main theses of the free law school. That so-called application of statutes by courts and administration is true lawmaking. Now, I must admit that I am a little bit naive 
about the free law school. These were certain mad people in Europe a long time ago. I understand, however, that it's a similar movement in thought in some ways to American legal realism. I don't want to say who borrowed from whom, who copied whom or whatever. It, I want to draw your attention to a gentleman called William Ebenstein. And he wrote a book published, a reprint, I think it was first published in 45, but a reprint in 69, entitled The Pure Theory of Law. If anyone here has any serious interest in Kelsen, please read Ebenstein's Pure Theory of Law. He tries to show that Kelsen and American legal, reason, legal realism fit together in a very interesting way. And we'll come to that. Ebenstein says, both emphasize the unpredictability, the indeterminacy of the legal process. That indeterminacy is a product of the volitional aspect, will. If it were merely a cognitive function, the jurist could predict for every individual case. This illogical, irrational element is recognized by the pure theory as inhering in every stage of the law. That's what makes Kelsen interesting to me. He's intellectually anarchical. He has this wild streak of, it's not all fixidity of rules. Now I want to move part two, hierarchical, or steps or stairs. And steps or stairs is Ebenstein's own language. It's, yeah. And this wonderful quotation from Algemeine Stadtschlerer, at the end or in the beginning, according to the point of view, is the word or the deed. What does that mean? Only the basic norm, the presupposed basic norm, is pure lawmaking. Only the implementation of the ultimate legal consequence is pure act. Everything in between is partly lawmaking, partly law creation, partly law application. Creation of law, says Kelsen, is always application of law. For Kelsen, a peculiarity of law is that it regulates its own creation. The higher norm may determine, one, the organ and the procedure, two, the content. From this perspective, the judicial decision creates an individual norm, the content of which is often only partly determined by the higher norm. Although that's not necessarily so, because it is possible that the legislator is content to institutionalize a court and leave the court to decide according to its wide discretion. Even more obvious in modern legal systems is this the case in administrative agencies. Very frequently a statute will empower an administrative agency to act according to its discretion. Even in those circumstances, Kelsen insists that that is legal, that is law application. The decision of the court or agency is for Kelsen law only because that court or that agency is authorized by law, by the higher norm. Kelsen goes further, claims the general norm of adjective law, which authorizes this and only this individual or institution to decide, is to be understood in the alternative. The judge is to decide the concrete case according to general norm or according to his own discretion. This may make a degree of sense if the or is strongly disjunctive. If there is no substantive norm to apply, obviously the judge would have very strong discretion. But where there is a detailed substantive general norm, one might take the view, many people do take the view, the judge is bound to apply it according to its meaning and cannot override disregard or disapply it. Helson wishes us to understand 
the determination of the lower norm by the higher norm can never be complete. The higher norm can bind, cannot bind, in every direction. There must always be more or less room for discretion. So the higher norm, says Kelsen, has the character of a frame to be filled in. This entails, at the very least, that several different interpretations may be consistent with the higher norm. Every act, says Kelsen, that stays within the frame is legal. For Kelsen, every law applying act is only partly determined by law, it's also partly determined by an act of will, which the law applying organ chooses between the possibilities showed by what he calls cognitive interpretation. This act of will is necessarily for Kelsen law creating. As Holmes apparently put it, the judge enjoys the sovereign prerogative of choice. This entails no law in the individual case until the judge decides. Words of Adolf Merkel, another member of the pure school. If legal science wants to be able to say what the law is for individual cases, then it must ask the judge. The judge, as you understand, is the only authentic interpretation. Anything else is legally irrelevant opinion. I think the European Court of Human Rights, I think the House of Lords in England, soon to be a Supreme Court, gets things wrong. But that's just opinion. There's a special status to the decision of a court. It is the authentic interpretation. So far, most of what I've recounted is fairly orthodox. One right answer thesis, such as Ronald Dworkin's, have attracted few friends. And perhaps we are all American realists now, having long realized, recognized, that judges are not merely subsumption automatons, and that law application is not a matter of watertight logical deduction, but is always irreducibly dispositive, always involves an act of will. But then, inside Kelsen, comes this remarkable twist. He says, by way of authentic interpretation, that is the interpretation of the law applying organ, not only one of the possibilities may be realized that have been shown by cognitive interpretation of the norm to be applied, but also a norm may be created which lies entirely outside the frame of the norm to be applied. I pause for a moment because that is the crux of my argument. Kelsen says and says very plainly again and again and again that the law applying organ not only can choose among possible meanings inside the frame but could also choose outside the frame. That's the alternative character of the norm. And I emphasize that because it is very, very surprising. It entails that a judge authorized by adjective norm to apply substantive norm as a choice. Apply the norm or not. And that does seem a very odd position to defend. But that's the, the position I claim Kelsen claims, and that's the position I want to be able to defend. Moreover, I go on to argue that there can be little room for doubt that this is exactly what Kelsen meant by the <coughs> alternative character of the norm. This is not open to exegetical debate. We can, of course, accept a legislator is perhaps less bound by the Constitution than a judge is by statute. We could also accept that administrative agencies may be less bound than are the courts by substantive civil and criminal statutes. Nonetheless, Kelsen's overall approach is that any such differences are relative. He says, just as the courts may be authorized under certain circumstances not to apply the existing statutory or customer law, 
but to act as a legislator and to create new law so the ordinary legislator may be authorized under certain circumstances to act as a constitutional legislator. If a statute enacted by the legislative organ is considered to be valid, although it has been created in another way, or has another content than prescribed by the Constitution, we must assume that, that these prescriptions of Constitution concerning legislation have an alternative character. In other words, the President of the United States of America must comply with the Constitution or not. That's a very, very, very challenging position. Legislators entitled by the Constitution either to apply the norm laid down or to apply other norms upon which he may decide. Otherwise, says Kelson, a statute whose creation or contents did not conform with the prescriptions directly laid down could not be regarded as valid. But, says Kelson, I'm interpreting now, such a deviant statute is valid if it is part of a by and large effective legal order, is made by an authorized institution, and itself becomes by and large effective. Mm -hmm. Kelson also deploys res judicata, to support his notion of the alternative character of the norm. He takes the view that any judicial decision, however erroneous, however deviant, however crazy, is valid if not annulled by and through an authorized process. It follows that the incorrect decision is and will remain law if not set aside by further judicial process. For example, appeal or judicial review. The law also prescribes that a judicial decision which does not conform to the direct stipulation shall remain in force until it has been abolished by a decision of another court. If this procedure is exhausted, or if no such procedure has been provided, then there is res judicata, a decided thing, there is finality. The grossest error by the most supreme court of a legal system thereby becomes law. That, of course, is error. Error is accident. The feasibilism is design. But if accidental error becomes law, deliberate disobedience may also become law. In relation to the higher norm, says Kelsen, the lower norm possesses the force of law. Thus, the determination of the lower norm by the higher norm has the character of an alternative prescription. Kelsen, by the way, applies like reasoning to the relationship between international and national law. If the content of the norms of the national or legal order are determined by international law, it has an alternative sense only. The possibility of norms with contents other than prescribed is not excluded. Now, I want to add, because I can see that skepticism is bubbling away here quite happily on the, on the back burner. Kelsen of co for, for Kelsen, of course, the alternative character of the norm, I insist, is an integral part of his whole theory. Because it, and only it, ensures there can be no contradiction between an inferior and a superior norm is important, too, to his thesis of the unity of a normative order. For Kelsen, a norm contrary to a norm is a self-contradiction, cannot be part of the system. In addition to such internal coherence, justification of the alternative character of the norm may also be found in the core elements of legal positivism, to which I now um, turn. Everybody okay so far? Um, good. Kelsen's is a radical pedigree theory. The norm system that presents itself as a legal order has essentially a dynamic character. A legal norm is not valid because it has a certain content. 
content deducible from a presupposed basic norm, but because it is created in a certain way. Therefore, famous ringing statement of legal positivism, any content can be law, law can have any content. But now, to this standard element of legal positivism, Kelsen adds a further criterion. A minimum of effectiveness is a condition of validity. That's a hard doctrine and not everybody loves it. But if we accept that that's part of Kelsen's deal, the correct determination of this relationship, as he says, is one of our most difficult problems. But taking these two points together, dynamic, pedigree, and effectiveness, even if a general norm to be applied by the court is valid, which predetermines the content of the individual norm to be created by the court, an individual norm created by the court of last instance can become valid whose content does not conform to this general norm. In short, as I summarize it, I know Kelson said this somewhere, but to my shame I could not find the precise quotation. Subsumption is subordinated to the principle of delegation. It is law not because of content, but because of who makes it, and who makes it is determined by a principle of delegation. Pedigree, therefore, always pumps content for the Now I move to the nuts and bolts, to the center of my thesis, the feasibilism. So far, I've tried to summarize in a very short time, selective quotations, of course, my understanding of the great man's works. Accordingly, Kelson appears to be saying it is a necessary feature of his conception of a legal order that a court can choose not to apply a general norm but to make new law outside the frame. That looks a bit like asserting a power to disregard, disapply or defeat a valid norm and substitute a different norm of the court's devising. Kelsen, by the way, and I, I'm sure you know this, uh, takes the view that the legal order cannot have any gaps. I agree. The law is binary. It either provides the remedy the plaintiff seeks or it does not. Faced with that fact, that reality, the court has two options. First, it may dismiss the plaintiff's claim on the basis that the general norms provide no remedy. The alternative is where the court finds the lack of such a general norm, and I quote from Kelson, unsatisfactory, unjust, or inequitable. It may create for the concrete case a norm of substantive law it considers satisfactory, just, or equitable. The court then functions, of course, as a legislator. In fact, Kelsen qualifies this last point in that he points out that in such cases the court need not be creating general norms as under a system of precedent, but create, create only an individual norm valid for the single present case. Nonetheless, this looks to me exactly like the feasibles. An example of the first option, I go off Kelsen for a moment in, into some details of English law. Have a look at Payton against British Pregnancy Advisory Service Trustees in 1979. Here a man wishes to the court to grant him an injunction against a woman having an abortion because of his asserted right to be a father. Maybe he had no further chances to be a father, maybe he was shot off in the war, I don't know what. But he applies to the court for an injunction against British Pregnancy Advisory Service providing an abortion for the woman he claims is pregnant with his child, although how would he know? No previous claim of this sort had been litigated in the British courts. At the start of his judgment, Sir George Baker, President of the Family Division, says, in the discussion of human affairs and especially of abortion, 
Controversy can rage over the moral rights, duties, interest standards and religious views of the parties. Moral values are at issue. I am in fact concerned with none of these matters. I am concerned and concerned only with the law of England as it applies to this claim. There being no authority for the remedy, he said, go away, you silly boy. It's her body, it's her decision. End of statement. Basically, if you're going to introduce a right for a putative father to resist an abortion, you would have to do it by legislation, not by judicial action. An example of the second option, however, where a court disregards the current law and invents a new norm, consider Henningsen. I like that case. It's got four ends. A case name with four ends is very interesting. Against Bloomfield Motors, 1960 case in America. Mr. Henningsen had bought a car under a contract, which included a term limit limiting the manufacturer's liability exclusively to repairing defective parts. The court, however, agreed with his argument the manufacturer <coughs> should not be protected by the term and should meet the medical and other expenses of those injured in a crash even though there was no statute nor common law rule in support. The court relied, I love this, on the following ringing dictum. Is there any principle which is more familiar or more firmly embedded in the history of Anglo-American law than the basic doctrine that the courts will not permit themselves to be used as an instrument of iniquity and injustice? That's wonderful. We will trump the law to do justice. Riggs and Pammer, which I assume you're all very familiar with, is another extraordinarily well-known example. Interesting, interesting to me, Kelson notes, the fact that a legal order lacks a legal norm that stipulates punishment for the theft of electricity may be regarded as inequitable or as inequitable or unjust as much as the fact the legal order contains a legal norm applicable to murder with robbery in the same way as to a case in which a son kills his incurable father upon the latter's request. In English, in England, the Larceny Act of 1916 made special provision for stealing of electricity because it was not subject of asportation. You could not take and carry it away. The novel conception of appropriation, somewhat akin to the contractatio of Roman law, introduced in the Theft Act 1968, might have been wide enough to include abstraction of electricity. But the legislator, in the event wisely enacted in section 13, a specific offence of abstracting electricity. Wisely, because it was duly held by our courts, that electricity is not property within section 4 of our Theft Act, and that switching on the current is not appropriation. I have a footnote here, and I would welcome, not necessarily today, because this is further work rather than criticism of me, um, to explore how criminal codes in mainland Europe have dealt with this issue and how judges have responded because a like problem and although I have a theory that works for me in England and America and so forth I want it to work also today mainland Europe tomorrow South America finally the world Kelsen's second example takes us straight to a contemporary controversy in law and morals in Britain namely assisted suicide. I mentioned two cases, Pretty in 2002, Purdy in 2008. I'm not going to go into much of the details. We're talking here about terminally ill people suffering very serious illness who want to die, who want help. They want help not from a doctor necessarily, but from their loved ones, their family. In common with other prosecutors, the DPP has discretion. No prosecution, I apologize for the spelling, can be brought, I apologize for the spelling, in England for assisted suicide under the Suicide Act without consent. 
those whose, I'm sorry for the spelling, relatives are in tragic circumstances and travel from the UK to Switzerland for death with dignity, naturally would like to know in advance of the individual case whether they're going to be prosecuted. But so far the DPP has neither given any assurance in advance in an individual case, nor has he published any statement of policy. Actly has it been written, and this is my introduction to you, the second most important book, apart from Evan Stein's Pure Theory, Mortimer and his daughter Sanford Kadish, Discretion to Disobey. When legal officials have either delegated or deviational discretion, I'll discuss these concepts shortly, to determine the class of cases covered by a peremptory rule, they may or may not enforce, the citizen is, sorry for the typo, left with a puzzle. The law forbids a form of conduct under, again, sorry for the typo, circumstances A, B, and C. Officials charged with the enforcement of the law enforce it only, or for the most part, under circumstances A and B. What then are the citizens to make of their obligation towards the peremptory rule under circumstances C? Of course, it is very unlikely in Britain today that there will be a prosecution of a husband going to Switzerland with his wife for her voluntary suicide in Switzerland. My own view is nobody's guilty of any crime, nobody commits a crime in England or in Switzerland. But some people want the assurance first. She says to him, I'm only willing for you to help me if I know you will not be punished by the law. And it seems to me a perfectly reasonable question to ask. But that's a separate issue I've written about elsewhere. Kelson cites the Swiss Civil Code, as of course it was at the time of his writing, as a typical illustration of the untenable gap theory. He quotes, the law is applicable to all legal problems for which it contains a rule explicitly or by interpretation. If no prescri prescription is contained in the law, hmm, that seems to contradict the first sentence, the judge shall decide according to custom, and where this too is lacking, according to the rule he would establish were he a legislator. Kelson comments, a legal order is always applicable and is actually applied even where the court must dismiss the action on the grounds that the legal order doesn't contain a general rule imp imposing the obligation asserted. It follows for Kelson, and I agree, theory of gaps is a fiction falsely assuming the impossibility of applying the norms of the legal order. Kelsen suggests, bless him, that the moral political point of the fiction is to encourage what he calls legal security, at the expense of what he calls flexibility. What I refer to as the twin desiderator of certainty and justice, both of which I claim cannot be fully realized by the legal order. The more you try to make the system just, the less certain. The more you try to make it certain, inevitably, I can explain that, the less just. Now, defeasibilism has seemed to some of its critics, whatever merits they may otherwise acknowledge, to be potentially anarchical, licensing any and every departure from general norms. Fred Shower made that point in Oxford. Although not a fully paid-up, card-carrying, self-styled defeasibilist, Kelsen offers a telling answer to that charge. He says, a status where everybody is authorised to declare every norm, that is to say everything that presents itself as a norm, as null, is almost a state of anarchy. I agree. Modern national law reserves the competence to declare a norm as null, that is, to annul a norm for special organs. I don't know if it's a special category, Giovanni, of derogation, but you understand, yeah? What is practically possible within a national order is, at most, that everybody 
is authorized to consider a legal norm as null, but at the risk that his conduct, if contrary to the norm, might be considered by the competent order to be a delict, provided that the competent order does not confirm the subject's opinion as to the invalidity of the norm. So take a chance. You may lose, you may win. That a norm may be created only by a competent organ entails also that only the competent organ may create a norm annulling another norm. Whether we call that uncommanding or derogation doesn't quite matter, it's the same deal. If the legal order were to permit everyone to decide this question, a judicial decision binding on the parties would hardly come to pass. Hence, according to positive national law, this question can only be decided by the court itself or a higher court. Discretion to disobey. Kadish and Kadish distinguish deviational I don't like that word, it's very American, and delegated discretion. The first involves exercise of authority in ways or on the basis of considerations either unauthorized or prohibited by rules of competence. An example might be the refusal of the Court of Appeal in England to follow the rules of precedent in two recent cases, one civil and one criminal. And I refer in the footnote to Great Peace Shipping, which is a case in the law of contract, and R versus James and Karimi, a case to do with provocation in English criminal law. And I refer you to my earlier paper on defeasibilism and adjudication on this. This entails not only an official's deciding the substantive issue without the guidance of legal rules, but also his disregarding the answer provided by law in favour of his own judgment on the merits. The second involves delegated discretionary powers expressly provided for in norms of competence, including wide discretionary authority vested in governmental departments, agencies and emanations of the state. As Unger recognised, even delegated discretion raises serious issues for the rule of law approach. Obviously, deviational discretion raises such issues even more acutely. So much so that Kadish and Kadish boldly argue that the rule of law model is not necessarily the ideal model for the functioning of legal systems. The need for delegated discretion is widely recognized and accepted <coughs> nowadays. No modern system of law and government can exist without delegating discretionary powers. So the modern issue as to delegated discretion is the scope and reach of judicial review and the requirement of public bodies to conduct themselves in accordance with the provisions of such texts as the European Convention of Human Rights. It is therefore deviational discretion that poses the greatest challenge for law and legal theory. Roscoe Pound suggested long ago that almost all the problems of jurisprudence come down to a fundamental one of rule and discretion. Whereas that may be an overstatement, discretion remains a central issue in legal theory. As is well known, Ronald Dworkin offered a tripartite account of discretion, distinguishing two weak senses and one strong sense. First, and very weak, is the notion that for some reason the standards an official must apply cannot be applied mechanically, but demand the use of judgment. Yeah. Nothing great or significant or novel in this. The successful functioning, says Lon Fuller, of a legal system depends upon repeated acts of human judgment at every level of the system. Secondly, in a different weak sense, some officials have final authority and cannot be reviewed and reversed by any other official. Dworkin turns to baseball 
to illustrate this point. But perhaps association football yeah. is more familiar to Europeans. At the time of writing, Mr. Darren Fletcher, a Manchester United player, has just been sent off by the referee in a UEFA semi-final, with the consequence that he automatically will miss the final, a match of huge significance in the career of a player for whom, conceivably, it might be the only chance. I now have to add, Senor something Abidal, but nobody yet can tell me Senor Abidal's <laughs> given name. <laughs> Maybe he's such a great player like uh, Pelle or Plato that he only has one name. <laughs> no, he didn't. No? He's never played. That's part, of the, that's part of the sadness. Many commentators consider, and I agree, that no foul was committed and that the referee erred. In England, where I sit on Football Association regulatory commissions, we have power to rescind a red card on grounds of mistaken identity or where the referee has made an obvious error. UEFA only allows appeals on mistaken identity. In England, of course, we consider our approach fairer and we believe it's desperately unjust to deny an innocent player a special career opportunity because of an obvious error by an official. But the decision of a referee under UEFA jurisdiction is final, in the sense that there is no form of appeal or review, and therefore that decision, irrespective of how erroneous, is instantly res judicata, as Kelsen might put it. It's binding and it's law no matter how wrong. There's no further legal procedure of appeal or review. I'm hearing some noises now emanating from some people in UEFA that they might have a look at this. And maybe it's easier now that both Barcelona and Man United have players who would like to play. But it would be an extraordinary step for UEFA to rescind these two red cards. It would make them very, very English. And they have been so opposed to our re-refereeing games. Ours is not an authentic interpretation is just opinion. Kelsen actually does put it, the opinion that an innocent individual was sentenced is legally excluded because all other than the duly authorized official are individually legally not competent, that's to say not authorized to ascertain this. Theirs is not an authentic interpretation and is therefore legally irrelevant. Of course the referee got it wrong, makes no difference at all. England won the World Cup with what was a goal. A Russian linesman said it was a goal. Therefore it was a goal. But that is simply a binding decision. Many people have analysed this. Some go one way, some the other. Thirdly, and in a strong sense, according to Warkin, discretion connotes that on some issue he, the official, is simply not bound by standards set by the authority in question. In Colsenian terms, instance of a norm of competence determining the personal but not the material element, such the official is wholly unconstrained by any material general norm. This is what Kadish and Kadish refer to as delegated discretion. And without my offering examples, it is a very familiar feature of modern legal systems. However, significantly missing from Dworkin's account is anything remotely akin to deviational discretion. That is to say, discretion in yet stronger sense, stronger sense still, which is discretion to disobey. That's the title of their book. The question for the addressee of the rule is not about the rule's existence or its content, but whether one is free to act upon one's own judgment. The issue is the degree to which, if at all, a legal rule is binding upon individual conscience or is a reason for action in all the circumstances of the case. Final question, then, is whether Kelsen's notion of discretion is delegated or deviational. Is it a de jure 
or a de facto power to disregard, disapply, or defeat an application, an applicable general norm. Much of what Kelson actually writes is consistent with delegated discretion. He talks about authorization all the time. And modern legal systems reveal many instances, for example, in my own system, the Forfeiture Act of 1982. We had a crazy rule, it's, it's Riggs and Pammer. The crazy rule, common law rule forfeiture. If I kill, I cannot inherit under the will, even if the will is perfectly valid. That's the forfeiture rule. Modern life has given us many women who are treated, and not just women, but mostly women, treated very badly, um, and they've, been, they've killed their husbands, and they've been excused of virtually any criminal liability because the whole situation has been horribly dysfunctional. So we pass the Forfeiture Act to give the court in subsection to the power, having regard to the conduct of the offender and of the deceased, and such other circumstances as appear to the court to be material, the justice of the case requires the rule to be modified. Why we have to give our judiciary the power to do justice by statute, when in my submission, Doing justice is an inherent power of the judiciary. But such is our commitment to parliamentary sovereignty that we have to tell judges, you can do justice on this occasion, but don't, you can't do it anywhere else. The whole thrust of Kelsen's theory, I claim, is consistent only with deviational discretion. Because the alternative character of the norm involves disregarding, disapplying, or defeating an applicable general norm going outside the frame and creating law, at least in the individual case. This, for Kelsen, of course, involves a degree of legislative decentralization. He says, and clearly he can talk about England or America here, the law-creating function of the courts becomes particularly visible when the court is authorized to create a general norm by establishing a precedent. To give such an authorization to a court, especially a court of last resort, is particularly commendable. I've stuck on that word. It sounds almost like Kelsen is saying good, and Kelsen's not allowed to say good, he's a pure theorist. I think he possibly means noteworthy, comment able. I must look at the German to see if this is, but commendable would not be. But it's nonetheless, it's particularly important when the court is authorized to decide a case under certain circumstances, not by applying a general norm, but according to its own discretion. In other words, if the court is authorized to create an individual norm whose content is not predetermined by the general law of positive law. To bestow the character of a precedent on such a deviant decision is only a consistent enlargement of the court's law-creating function. This passage reveals much. Not least that Kelsen himself is not perhaps all that clear whether his notion of discretion is delegated or deviation. Doesn't matter. Sense in which this is unimportant. In that although he deploys the language of authorization and delegation, Kelsen embraces a very strong form of discretion which permits the court to disregard, disapply, or defeat an applicable general norm and substitute a new individual or general norm of its own devising. That seems essentially the feasibleist. Conclusion, you'll be grateful to hear. In this paper, I have sought to address the issues left hanging at the conclusion of my paper on defeasibilism and adjudication. That is the possibility of moving from adjudication to legal theory. I've sought to deploy an understanding of Kelsen, Kelsenian legal theory to that end. If Kelsen may be captured for a defeasibleist concept of law or legal order, then perhaps I have moved the debate on defeasibleism as a legal theory rather than a methodology or pragmatism forward. Thank you very, very much for your patience.